All right, guys, welcome to a new episode of the Type 1 Lifting Podcast. I have a very awesome guest. I was looking forward to um, doing this podcast with him. He is a IFBB pro uh, and a doctor in chiropractic uh, practice, Dr. Brett Kahn. How you doing? Good, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. I I actually saw you, I I think it was on, I know it was on Instagram. And so I saw you on like a, someone's like, like the, you know, search page and you came up and I was like, Oh snap. He's a diabetic too. That's, that's awesome. You know, I, cause like, you, I don't, I never really hear of like too many like diabetic bodybuilders and you were kind of like the first one, um, to show up. And so I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. There's, um, you know, there's not too many of us, obviously, you know, the, the difficulty of, um, managing type one is one thing, but then, you know, adding the component of bodybuilding, which, you know, similar to CrossFit in, in, in that manner, pushes your body in different directions and different things. And when your when your body composition is is changing to add muscle and get, you know, this big and then get as lean as possible, there's uh there's a lot more that goes into it. You know, obviously, you know, lows and highs and stuff can really deter someone from it. So, you know, it was uh, a bit of a challenge at first, but um, you know, one that I enjoyed and could kind of continue on with. Very cool. Now I when I was doing some research on you, um, I did listen to a couple podcasts. So um what do you what do you think about doing podcasts? Um, I've only done I mean, I guess I've done a handful of them or so over the years, but uh, yeah, they're cool. They're enjoyable. You know, usually, you know, you get a little banter back and forth, learn something, um, you know, from uh, who's ever who's ever putting it on like yourself. Like, you know, I, I just got a little bit of background on you, you know, prior to this. Um, and I was like, hey, I'm just gonna jump in, you know, <laughs> answer the questions as they come and then I uh, go from there. But yeah, man. Very cool. No, no, gotcha. I'm not, I don't do gotcha moments. So just, just yeah. let you know. So there's no gotcha okay. stuff in here. So, okay. um, so, um, I know like I'm relatively new to the, the bodybuilding space. Cause like, you know, I mainly do CrossFit and like Olympic weightlifting and I've always wanted to learn a little bit more in the space. But before I kind of talk about that, um, I always ask like my diabetic guests, you know, when did they get diagnosed with diabetes? Yeah. So my story, I, you know, I'll, I'll try to keep it you know, shorter, but I was, I was a college athlete. So I played football at at Michigan state university. And I think my pancreas just kind of slowly stopped making insulin really over the course of like a year, year and a half. Like it it seemed like a long, because I had a lot of the symptoms and they seemed to really kind of increase. And I wasn't officially diagnosed until um, right after a bowl game, my senior year, I had played in the champ sports bowl and I was down about 24 pounds wow, from like yeah. normal weight. I was already one of the smaller guys on the team. So I'm running down the field, you know, division one football weighing like 160 something pounds looking like, you know, I was straight out of high school, but I should have been, <laughs> you know, at, at my biggest. Um, and then uh, I was working a summer job. It was just like a couple of weeks after that. I remember just, you know, mopping. I could only mop like maybe, you know, five foot space. And I was just like out of breath and just about to kill over the doc called up. I was like, yeah, we got your blood work in. Um, your blood sugar is 800. I was like, sounds like a big, is that a good number? <laughs> no, <I don't> know. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, you need to go to the ICU right now. You know? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, that was kind of the, the beginning of it, but I had felt so bad leading into that, that, uh, it was like anything I did, I would, I would get sick and obviously polyuria, probably, you know, dipsia and, and all that stuff. Um, that I was just really more than anything, just relieved to be like, well, shit, I didn't, I thought I was dying, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so, and my body was just eating itself away for so long that, um, you know, it sh- really should have been caught sooner, but, um, but you know, once it was, I was like, all right, this is, this is a diagnosis. So let's just roll with it. Yeah. Now, um, I do have to give you a heads up. So I know you played at Michigan state. I'm a huge Michigan fan. Uh-oh. So well, I, I, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it doesn't ruin the podcast, but um, obviously like, you know, being a D1 athlete and I, and I know, I believe you did uh, track for a little while too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, just like my, my, like a year and a half and okay. then um, just stuck with football. Yeah. yeah. So um, obviously, you know, when you got diagnosed with diabetes, it was kind of like a little bit of a relief that you knew actually what was, what was going on. So how, how were you handling, you know, your diabetes throughout like the whole, like the next season or whatnot? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, The unfortunate thing was, is that it was right after my senior season, like literally like a week or so after. Um, So, you know, it was was kind of sad in the fact that, you know, 
you know, I was playing more as like a sophomore, junior, but then it's like halfway through my junior and my senior year, you know, I was just trying to survive, you know, practices. Like, I mean, I was like, you know, just on the brink of dying. And the crazy thing was, I remember we were doing summer conditioning and um, I'm trying to eat more than anyone on the team. I'm talking about, you know, we got guys 320 pounds. I would eat three massive plates of food every single time I sat down. And the more I ate, the more weight I lost. And I remember, I remember this thinking like, this is weird. Like, the more I'm eating, the more weight I'm losing because the blood sugar is just going crazy, right? Nothing was being absorbed. And then we'll, certain points we would do um, really intense conditioning, like just all sorts of like, you know, hours of the workouts, sprints out in the sun, stadium steps. And the more I ran, my weight, I would start gaining weight again. So what was <laughs> happening is, is I was offsetting it with a crazy amount of intense physical activity was bringing my blood sugars down. So I was, you know, probably in a range to where I wasn't as malnourished from, you know, being crazy high blood sugars. I've ever told my, what about my uh, assistant strength coaches that he's like, he's like, that's crazy, man. Like what that makes no sense. I, was like, <laughs> I know it doesn't, but I was just like, I don't know what's going on. Um, so, so yeah, it wasn't until um, just after that. And then, um, you know, I guess I was lucky enough in the way that we had some nutritionists on staff. And, and at that point, the docs were kind of like, shit, we missed this, you know, which is like, I mean, it's the biggest red flag in the world if, if you know the symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, although I did, I was kind of, honestly, I was trying to hide it, you know, because I was like trying to gain weight. So I was weighing in, but weighing in before every single uh, weightlifting session. And we would wear like the football pants where you put your pads in it, the thigh pads underneath our shorts is just like, you know, underwear basically. So I would just slip a five pound weight in each of them <laughs> to make sure that you know, they weren't catching on to me losing weight. Right. Yeah. Um, that's just crazy and stupid when I go back and think about it. But, um, but after that, it was like, you know, my body just responded to, you know, food and stuff again and being in the gym. And it was like, you know, within the matter of a couple of months, everyone's like, like, shit, Con, like, what happened to you? Like, you look good, you know, like, you, you look, you know, beefy and busty, like, where, where, where was this, you know? And then, um, <laughs> then I kind of explained the whole situation to everybody. Yeah. So when you, when you got diagnosed after like the whole season was over, did, did your friends kind of understand what was going on with like your new diagnosis at all? You know, it, it was weird. And, I, and I've seen this with, um, you know, diabetics that are newly onset and some that I've, you know, worked with and stuff. I, I don't, I was just, I didn't want, and maybe it was the mindset of like, it's not broke, don't fix it. Or you're I'm a tough guy in events. I wasn't mm -hmm. really telling anybody about it. You know, I, I told like a few people about it. Um, mm -hmm. And then I just kind of kept it to myself for the most part, you know, you know, a few people heard here and there um, cause it was like after the season and stuff. So it wasn't as big of a deal as if maybe I was you know, diagnosed during, um, but yeah, I, I was, I don't know if I was ashamed. I just didn't know how to have the conversation. You know, there's those weird things about um, going out to eat, you know, I'd maybe go to the bathroom and feed my insulin, you know, and eventually I got over that. And I'm like, Hey, I don't, shouldn't care what people think. Yeah. Be a, um, you know, like, I, I don't know, I'm not going to run to the bathroom every time I need a jet because I'm injecting <laughs> off and stuff. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, I mean, obviously you were at a big, big school and for the big 10 there, you must have some do you have like any funny stories of like your college experience? Like any, anything, like does that have to be diabetes related? Um, shoot. I mean, sports, like sports related, I'll say the, the first game that, uh, that I played in and traveled to was um, Notre Dame and we ended up winning in like triple overtime. And um, it, wasn't, it wasn't my idea, but someone on the team grabbed our flag and ran it um, to the middle of the field and planted it in the middle of the field. And um, it ended up being on like the cover of like the, you know, the newspaper and everything. And I had a lot of people at home back where I'm from didn't even know I was at Michigan State playing there because I actually had originally taken a scholarship to a smaller D1 school my, my very, my freshman year. But mm -hmm. then I had a preferred, I was a preferred walk on at Michigan State, meaning like you don't have to try out and you're probably going to get a scholarship, but we're not giving you a scholarship out the gate. Um, so then I had came back to that. And, um, you know, by the time I was playing, people were like, like hey I heard you're on like so basically I'm in the cover of like the newspaper playing the flag in Notre Dame's field which is pretty cool you know and that's cool real um you know being that's where you know Rudy and stuff was filmed and I had you know watched that and enjoyed it growing up very cool do you still have the newspaper yeah 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 nice is it framed you have to frame it um 
No, I don't have a frame. It's probably just with a bunch of other crap. I'd probably <laughs> have to dig around to find it. But. All good. All good. So um, obviously, like, the, the whole season's over. So did you, is the reason why you kind of got into bodybuilding, was it kind of like an empty space of, like, not playing sports? Because for me, like, I, I played sports in college. It was obviously, it was like a low, small, like, D3 school. And I just felt, like, kind of empty. Did you have that feeling at all? Yeah, I remember, you know, right after, like, because, I mean, as you know, like, every minute of like our schedules were given to us and they weren't like, all right, from five to five 30, you're doing this. It was like from five to five 17, you're doing this. And from, you have three minutes to get here. So from five 21 to, you know, um, so there was a void and, and obviously I was like, all I knew was like, all right, going and lift. And I just tried to kind of continue that, but it was a very odd feeling because we would have, I don't know, five, six strength coaches on breathing down. us. We're always partnered up. So always someone's pushing you, beating, beating you up um so like you go to the gym alone after that and it's like crickets and hard it was really hard to get motivated mm -hmm. um but because i was just diagnosed and my body was responding to food again and lifting it was like i was getting you know i was going from like this disheveled you know malnourished guy for x amount of time to like you know my the self i should have been you know so i went from like whatever like you know maybe up to like 185 190 and um from like one in the 160s you know so i mean i was loving it you know yeah i, yeah. I could have just went in there and just you know walked around the gym and i would have gained weight because <laughs> my, you know i was finally getting getting food and nutrition again yeah very cool so um when when did you realize you kind of wanted to push like the bodybuilding like a little bit further than you know or like a typical person like a typical gym goer yeah. So, I mean, it was actually quite a while after that, you know, for, so from there I went to chiropractic school, I was there for four years and um, I just stayed in the gym and I lifted and, you know, um, I would try to eat almost groundhog day, like meals just for blood sugar control. So it was more about, you know, just health and wellness. I just kind of continued lifting. And then I opened my practice. So, you know, at this point I'm, you know, I, I opened right out of school at 28 um, and, you know, I'd seen the, a show locally and I and I looked and there was the men's physique division which is more like a cover like men's health like you wear the board shorts you don't have to wear like the bikini bottoms and, and stuff and uh, I I was like that's cool I think I could you know maybe do that maybe I'll put it as like a bucket list thing um because I had come down here and I had played some intramural softball and you know flag football and you know as a chiropractor I'm working with my hands like you know jam my finger and sprain my wrist once i'm like you know i'm getting more injuries playing uh, intramurals than i ever did in college so <laughs> maybe i should you know re re you know align this energy so um yeah so i was just like heck i'll do a i'll do a show as um a bucket listing i had always um thought it was cool but i never wanted to look like a massive bodybuilder you know mm -hmm. um so i don't think the men's physique division was really kind of a thing until like maybe 2000 11 and then at that point it was kind of like oh it's like you know bodybuilders without legs you know they don't train legs and um it kind of had that kind of stigma around it but um yeah so i did the, my first local show and um ended up winning it and i remember the you know talking to the judges after like yeah you got a real good look and good structure and stuff they're like but you just need to come in a lot more condition because i was in the mindset of like you know get bigger and you know, bodybuilding big and um, so I was a lot softer than I probably should. I've always been a bit genetic with my, my abs. So I had, you know, you know, a bit of a six pack there. It's like, well, you need to lean out to where you get your obliques. And I'm thinking to myself, like, man, like I've always had a six pack. I've always been in shape, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. and I had done no cardio for this show. You know, I just lifted a little harder and I didn't really even diet that hard. Um, now again, it was a little bit easier in those initial, those initial years of the vision too. But, um, I'm thinking like, I don't, you know, I don't have those. And from that point forward, um, I was like, well, I'll do the national show. So I, I took the diet a little more seriously, you know, added a little cardio in. And then, you know, I just kind of saw all those little pieces um, add up and make, make a difference. And, um, you know, when I, when I did step on the national stage, I was just, you know, seeing where my, my hat would hang with those guys. Um, and long story short, ended up, you know, winning, um, going like 100% into it, ended up winning the the show and then when you do that you get your pro card so at that point i'm like well now i guess i have to see what you know these mm -hmm. how, how i do against the pros and um you know one thing led to another there placed in the 
uh, placed a you know top five in a bunch of pro shows. Did the Arnold, um, got some sponsorships with you know supplement companies and things like that. And then that's kind of led me to where I am now, which is you know focusing more on um, coaching people to compete um, and and people on the you know diet side of things as well. Um, okay, which is just as fulfilling, but with a little less cardio myself and a little yeah. less uh, downtime. Yeah. Yeah. So do you think the, the men's physique is kind of like one of the toughest divisions to kind of like get your start in or like go, go pretty far because there's like tons, tons of people from my point of view, I think there's a lot of people that already have that physique and can like easily walk in there and, and, you know, go to a show compared to like, obviously the bigger guys, they have to take like, you know, do a lot more things to get to that level. So do you think it's kind of harder to, to actually break into that? that category um you know it's become more and more popular and there there are there's a ton of competitors there's guys that have it naturally there's guys that um you know put in a, a, a ton of work to get there the ones at the very top and the ones that are gonna typically be pros are the ones that now have all components so they're mm-hmm. you know they have the genetics but they're also have to be extremely hard workers because it's a 24 7 sport you know, it, it's every little thing that you do, which really aligns with being type one diabetic, right? Because like this thing follows us everywhere. Like everything that we eat, everything that we do, uh, you know, take a hot shower, what's my blood sugar gonna do? Like take a nap, what's it gonna do? You know, every, you know, morsel that we put in our body, if you're dehydrated, you know, I always explain it as it's keeping a scale balance, but instead of the two sides, you got like 10. Yep. Uh, and bodybuilding similar to where, you know, you have to be very specific on, everything that you put in your body, the timing of it all, you know, the rest of it all, um, you know, the percentages of your macros and your cardio and your caloric intake. Um, so it's very detailed in that way, um, which I was, you know, kind of doing to an extent with just managing diabetes to where, you know, a lot of it meshed well for me. So it, it's difficult in that sense. But the, what I always tell people too is, you know, if you're going to be um, wanting to step on stage, the beauty of the sport is it's it's really you versus you, right? Mm, you yeah. get to be the, the clay and you get to see like, okay, how can I transform my body? What is my body capable of? What am I capable of? Um, because ultimately if you're taking yourself to, you know, your best genetic potential, then um, that's all you can do. So I knew when I had stepped on stage that um, it was unlike, you know, playing other sports to where, you know, I was nervous and how I was going to do. So I was like, all right, I put in the work, I'm here. Ultimately, when it comes down to it, it's a subjective measure. So whatever that judge thinks is what the placing is, um, which, you know, is, is good and bad, right? You know, yep. you're either going to like you or they're not, but it's not like you're competing against the guy next to you, not physically. Mm-hmm. I gotcha. So um, how did you manage your diabetes throughout, like, you know, getting to like, you know, I don't, do you guys do like a dehydration phase? And like, how do you, how does like, how do you manage your diabetes with that like whole process? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, there's different um, ways to come into a show. So, you know, you kind of have to see how your body reacts. You know, I had done shows to where I would, you know, cut or deplete water. I, I had even water loaded into a show because um, you're, you're going to get the body to a certain point uh, from a, from a leanness level. And then the rest is like, how are those muscles going to fill out? You know, yeah. the muscles are majority made of water. So depending on someone's um, specific anatomy, genetics, how their body responds to those things, then you manip- manipulate them. But, you know, like we said, we have one, two, three, five more things to think about. And uh, you start cutting water like that, then all of a sudden you see your, your blood sugar coming up. So then you really either have to be prepared or you almost have to do little test runs to see uh, how things are going to play out before they play out because you don't want to be there on show day. Blood sugars are super high. You know, cortisol ends up being high and it flattens the physique out and you don't look as um, full. Yeah. Because part of it is, you know, that illusion. You know, you got the, the tan and the overhead lights and then you, you, like I said, you're filling up with carbs, right? And then you're, you know, sucking the water out and um, it's all of those components that go together to give you that, you know, X amount of seconds on stage, which, which you're you know, ultimately judged on. Yeah. So when, um, when you're t- actually training and like, in the, like from, from what I've seen in some videos that like there's some people are absolutely mis- miserable for like calorie deficits and stuff like that. How, how do you still have the mindset that you want to like kind of push through and, you know, present yourself well on the stage? 
you know, I think if, and I've learned this over time, is like you, you could push yourself as hard as possible and be miserable for you know, 12, 18 you know, weeks or so. Uh, but if you do things the right way and you're at times doing things that might seem counterintuitive to the goal, and you're eating enough and you're keeping your metabolism stoked and you're, and you're doing it um, progressively, it doesn't have to be like this extremely difficult, um, you know, everyday sucks type of thing. And, mm -hmm. and it really almost seems like it has to be for some people, you know, some of the guys and people I, I've prepped before, they're like, they're almost like, this doesn't suck enough. It must not be working. And I was like, well, you know, I can, I can make it suck more, but if you put your body in the fight and flight, yeah. right? It's going to fight you, you know? Yeah. It's going to think that you're out in the wilderness and there's no food available and you're starving. It's just going to try to hold on to everything. Um, so you have to be clever. You have to trick it. You got to throw refeeds or carb cycles and things at it to kind of, you know, um, keep it guessing and, and keep it moving in the right direction. Um, and there's going to be a few weeks that suck typically at the end, but it doesn't have to necessarily be, be months. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Now, um, I, have you ever heard of a guy named Marcus Philly? Um, not ringing a bell. So he, he does this thing called functional bodybuilding. He was like a former CrossFit athlete turned, you know, he retired cause he kept on getting absolutely wrecked during like CrossFit workouts. And he's like, absolutely like shredded. So whenever you get a chance, you gotta, you gotta check out his, his uh, Instagram page. It's, it's like, everyone calls him like the Greek goddess. Cause he's like, yeah. so, so ripped. But do you, do you think that someone that just does like CrossFit and functional body, uh, bodybuilding could actually step on a stage, just doing that kind of workouts for the, you know, yeah. for, for pretty much for any, any category. Um, well, like I said, it depends. Like you're not going to step on as a bodybuilder being a CrossFitter. Yeah. There's too much size. There's too much caloric burn um, in those workouts. You yeah. Know, like now in, now you could step in stage in men's physique. Right. And, and, you know, if you ha have a nice build, I mean, there's CrossFitters that look great, you know, that if you learn how to suck the air in and pose and position properly, you know, they could step on stage um, probably at their comp, whatever they compete at some of them, you know, I mean, you know, it surprises me how lean some of these guys can be that do CrossFit and still be, so effective um from a from a production standpoint weightlifting wise because you know if you if you strip the, sh the shirts off of you know collegiate football players you think they all have you know ripped shredded bodies no, no, <laughs> like no. You, know, you might have a few guys genetically that do but for the most part you got a lot of extra calories on you because you know you, you probably have to eat 8k a day just to you know um be able to perform like that mm -hmm. but um yeah i think i answered the question yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, you did. No, most and funny thing is most of those like elite CrossFit athletes, they're consuming a, like an absorbent amount of carbs every day, yeah. like yeah. every day. Like I've heard people doing like six to 800, you know, it's, they're, you know, it's insane of like the amount of food they're, they're actually consuming. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you were talking about, um, you know, you being a doctor and, you know, being a chiropractor. So, um, I know that takes like a long time to get done. So like, what is it like roughly like four or five years to, for the yeah, whole four thing? years. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, I got it done in three and a half so that, you know, they tell you like, you know, like you can get the program done in three and a half. Um, and that's if like, you don't fail a single class basically. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think our class started with like 140 and there's only 30 of us that got through in three and a half because wow. you know, if you fail one, just, you know, based on when those courses are offered, then it sets you back, you know, basically half a year. So I was like, that's uh, nope, I'm getting, you know, getting it done. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, I'm getting it done three and a half, but yeah. Yeah. Very cool. So what made you get into that kind of that, that field? Yeah. I mean, you know, my, my, my background and stuff, um, in sports for one, you know, um, actually when I was in middle school, I had playing football and I, and I kind of jammed my head into the back of a, another player and, and messed my neck up pretty good. I had a good experience with a chiropractor then. And, my dad had thrown his back out and um, I'd saw it work well for him. And then, um, you know, I grew up with my father being in the construction trade. So like my mind's always been very mechanical and structural and stuff. And our body works in, you know, many of the same ways we got, you know, you know, hinges and pulleys and, um, you know, from a functional standpoint, it's always been something that's interesting to me. It's been intriguing um, to understand just how the human body works because it is really such a, such a cool, um, you know, marvelous miracle if, if it, if you understand it. Um, 
So, so yeah, I was just kind of drawn to it from, from that side of things. And I thought I wanted to do something in the healthcare field. And, you know, when I thought about being a Cairo, I was like, that just seemed like it. Yeah. It clicked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I know, um, from listening to another podcast, you actually got it done at life university down in Atlanta, my neck of yep. the woods. So, um, in Atlanta. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Marietta, just outside of Atlanta there. Yep. Yep. I live, I live for like about a half hour, 40 minutes away North. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. It's a good, awesome, it's a good time. Good place. So what, what, what were your thoughts about, uh, Georgia? Yeah, I liked it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it was cool. It was like a bunch of different pockets. Obviously it's like, you know, I was a young adult when I was there, but you're in school. So it's kind of like, you, just, you don't have any money to do much of anything. So <laughs> yeah. but I love, you know, going to, um, you know, some of the Blue Ridge mountains and the hikes and stuff and, you know, having sports teams there. I was actually just back for, Michigan State's bowl game, um, Peach Bowl. So that was, that was mm -hmm. cool to, to meet up with everybody. Um, and it was kind of being in Atlanta and enjoying like the warmer Southern weather and stuff that made me say to myself, okay, I want to start my practice somewhere, you know, um, in the South. And I ultimately landed in South Carolina here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what, what, made you, what made you, what was the final decision for South Carolina? Just, you know, be by the beach, warm weather, golf. Um, basically those things. Yeah. Yep. Very cool. Very cool. Now. Um, I mean, I've, I've heard some chiropractor horror stories before and you know, I have, like what makes you different compared to like anybody else? Um, well, you know, I, some of the horror stories, I mean, I don't know. It depends. I've, I've been, it's 10 years for me. And like, I haven't seen a horror story in my office. So, you know, I, some, I think movies sometimes dramatize things and people think like, oh, like, you know, when Jean-Claude Van Damme, like just walks up and twists someone's head that they're, <laughs> they're gonna, gonna die, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, it's, it's really not like that. And I also practice more um, personally as a, I don't know, you almost think of me you know, as like a hybrid chiro. So I do a bit of, you know, PT and rehab type stuff, a lot of soft tissue work um, like Gratston and, um, you know, inst uh, like instrument assisted soft tissue mobilization or active release, um, a lot of stuff that, you know, athletes and, you know, bodybuilders and stuff can benefit from, from a, from soft tissue standpoint, because your, your joints work obviously, um, integrated with your, your musculoskeletal system. Mm -hmm. So if one's not working right, you know, the other's affected. So try to make sure that we cover all the bases. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Now, do you, do you get like, do you get mad when someone doesn't call your doctor at all? No, not really. Okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, paid a lot for the, for the letters, but um, no, I mean, that's the, that, that, that's one of the things I do love about um, being a Cairo too. It's like, oftentimes people are a little nervous or apprehensive, you know, when they come in and sometimes they're kind of like, yeah, I'm going for back, you know, they've been nervous to come in, but they're going under the knife in like, you know, a couple months. Um, and they're kind of like, I figured I'd give it a try now. So it's cool when you're able to help someone out like that. Um, and they're kind of like, oh, wow. Like, this really works, you know, and they're usually like laugh and then people like to come see us, which is, which is neat, you know? So like, I enjoy it. I mean, like my patients um, and the ones that come for like more wellness care and seeing me um, as things spring up or just, you know, from time to time to make sure they're moving better. And um, you know, it's neat because I've garnered those relationships with all sorts of people. Yeah. I, I've never been to one. I've always wanted to go to one. I just, yeah. I just, I don't, I don't know. I just never had, never pulled the trigger. Yeah, some of the old school guys are, you know, in, in my opinion, and not to bash the profession, but yeah, every profession has theirs, you know, people, I mean, shoot, dude, you, you don't want to go to the, I mean, go to the wrong MD, and God knows what sort of poison they're going to give you, you True. know, yep. and, uh, you know, with the, the chiropractic profession too, the philosophy used to be like, oh, I adjust the bone in place, and I fix this and that, and, you know, I think there's been, you know, a wealth of meshing knowledge now with, um, just the ability for um, practitioners to, to, to cross populate and, and, you know, theories and things to be shared. Um, it's almost where like doctors of physical therapy now are doing a lot more manual therapy and stuff that chiros are doing and chiros are doing a lot more of the PT stuff, which has been interesting and cool to see. Yeah. Um, that's always the direction that I've wanted to see the profession go. I would actually love to be able to prescribe certain medications, you know, for certain things. So if someone is in a ton of pain and they need like an anti-inflammatory painkiller, you know, it'd be nice to say, okay, you can just get it here. We yep. give you a limited amount. And I'm really going to preach about like, let's use this to just get you out of, you know, severe pain so that we can maybe work on the issue and get you feeling better. Um, 
versus like here's a script for 90 of them go get a dick you know yeah uh, but at the same time i wouldn't want my male practice insurance to be as high as this guy <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, i'm a i'm a big i don't like taking anything i'm a big fan of like you know working it out in like mobility or anything like that just to kind of you know heal myself instead of like you know just pop an advil or, or whatever you know icy hots and stuff it's like it's i don't i don't think it's worth it it's better to kind of move and you know get better that way well yeah i would say it should be a hierarchy right you know and um i'll use this with my patients sometimes like if if i was there and i was standing on your toe right now your toe's gonna be hurting right like what's the most logical thing for you to do move you know you're not you're not gonna say like like damn Brett, my toes hurting me. Like we you, you pass me some Advil and you're yeah. like, okay, that's, give me something stronger. All yeah. right, it's working, but it's still there. All right, we're gonna go and we're gonna we're gonna inject the toe, and you're like, that's toe feels good now for two days, right? But now the toes, you know, coming back. It's like, okay, well, we're gonna go and we're just gonna do a you know a little dissection of the nerve, you know, and <laughs> but then you have another issue. It's like, okay, well, let's cut the no, like let's see if structurally, physically, we can just get me off the just get me off the toe, push me mm -hmm. back. Right. And that's sometimes when joints and muscles or, you know, postural components to it, or something's not moving correctly. If you can do that, then, you know, that's where you should start. Um, which isn't always the case because you have a limitation of matter, right. You know, if someone's, you know, joint or back is, you know, degenerated to a certain extent, you may be able to get them out of pain. You may not be able to, but those tools are always there. Um, but they can be a little more risky and a little more dangerous. Yeah. Okay. All right. Very cool. Now, um, I kind of want to go back to the bodybuilding real quick because I forgot to add this question. So um, I've actually seen some YouTube. I was when I was doing some research on you, I saw some, you know, YouTube videos of you during like bodybuilding.com YouTube channel, yeah. like working out with like other bodybuilders yeah. who, who were, who was like one of your most favorite, you know, bodybuilders to train with, like for the, it could be for like the day or, you know, if someone's yeah, yeah. close by it, like which one was like really stuck out to you? Like, man, like this is, this is like beating in another level. Yeah. Um, I would probably say like Ryan Terry, who's won, you know, the men's physique, um, Arnold and, you know, you always a contender at the Olympia or, uh, Sadiq, you know, Sadiq, um, you know, one of these, one of the most classic, I think physiques, you know, from our era that would probably go, you know, he'll be like, the, he's basically the Frank Zane of our time. Um, and, um, you know, him and I had both actually had the same coach when, when I was competing, um, which is also a cool part of the sport is the, you know, networking and you know, relationships and stuff that, um, that you build over time. But, to, but yeah, those guys, um, probably both of them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Now, um, obviously like, it's kind of like a one-on-one -on -one person, but like, do you, do you like get friendships throughout the whole process? Like, have you like met like some, like, good friends be like, Hey, I know this guy, you know, he's a great guy, you know, stuff oh, yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, all those guys, I have their numbers and, um, you know, when you, when you do what, like what you, what we do is like bodybuilders and stuff. It's kind of like you and I, like before we met, we we're in a club together, yeah. you know, we're like when diabetics, like, you know, we, we, we have, you know, that like unspoken relationship to where like, okay, I know what this guy goes through on a daily basis. And you kind of have that, you know, connection from a humanistic standpoint. And, um, you know, to, to be able to be as dedicated and put in the time and hours that it takes to, you know, be at that level and compete at that level, um, you have that mutual respect and understanding um, for each other too. And, um, you know, when you get up there with some of those, those top guys, and, and I had a period of time when I was you know, competing at that level, but with all that I do now, it's like, is either gonna be that or, you know, um, run my practice and coach people. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I took my genetics as far as I could. And I was like, all right, tip the hat, you know, um, the guy <laughs> that's getting too big for me, yeah. and, um, you know, now, now I'll go on and coach, but, um, but, but yeah, so, um, yeah, I've been lucky enough to make a good bunch of relationships. Very cool. Now you talked about coaching. So, um, what, what made you get into the coaching pretty much? Yeah. I mean, you know, I just, I had been, um, you know, cultivating, I guess, the knowledge from, you know, playing days to education to, you know, understanding more about nutrition and then, you know, taking, you know, courses, endocrinology, physiology, all, all these things. So like, it was kind of there on an underlying basis. Actually, I had even, um, 
without any certification when I was in, in, uh, in college, you know, Michigan State would train a couple people here or there. Mm-hmm. And I've um, just enjoyed that. So, you know, once I got a bit of a name competing and stuff, um, locally, people would ask me to coach them. And, and then I just kind of started, you know, taking people on from there. And um, you usually keep it to a limited amount. In the past year, I've opened up more time to coach more people, which has been cool because I've been able to um, be more involved in stuff with it, which has been, which has been cool. Yeah. So it, which is better you winning on stage or seeing one of your protégés that you coach yeah. win on stage? Yeah. It, it's definitely seeing um, someone that I've coached win on stage. Yeah. A hundred percent. It's always been like that, you know, when, whether it's like a family member or a friend, like, or, or someone I've coached, it's just, I don't know, it's emotionally just a different beast, you know, Be- mm-hmm. maybe it's a lack of control, you know, when <laughs> yeah. you're, you're there, but like, you know, you, you want them to win so bad um, versus I've always been, you know, just at peace with like, all right, I, I'm, I'm cool. With, I'm eating my cheese. I'm going to eat whatever I want after this. So I don't care what happens, you know, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the people that I've been, you know, fortunate enough to help turn pro, like uh, it's just been super, super cool and super fulfilling. And uh yeah, memories that I won't forget. And I know, yeah. you know, those guys, you know, it's a, a point in time in their life where um, you go through it with them, you push them to that point um, to to get their pro card and you help someone realize a dream like that is um, is pretty awesome. And I know, um, you know, they're, they're appreciative of it and, and we'll have that bond forever. Yeah, very cool. And I, I did hear in a podcast, you were actually training another type one diabetic. Do you have like any other ones that you train in? Like, how do you how do you handle their diabetes like while they're training? Yeah. Um, well, you know, as you probably know, like everyone's diabetes is a little bit different, you know? Um, I probably have, I've had more different points in time, but I probably have five to seven, you know, right now, um, some are competing, some are just, you know, lifestyle people. Um, but everyone's a little bit different. You know, I have a female competitor right now, um, who I've just started working with. And she has done an amazing job of keeping her blood sugars under control, but she's super low carb. She's maybe 15, 20 carbs a day. What? And yeah. And, and she has extremely, extremely tight, maybe the tightest blood sugars I've ever seen out to where she'll adjust down if she's at like 110. And I'm just like, so then, you know, so we're, we're trying to, to, to formulate and change her plan and introduce some, you know, variants in her macro profile so that we can get her body maybe where it's going to look best on stage Mm -hmm. um but it's been neat because i've been able to learn i mean she's had a one season the fours where most docs are probably like okay you're you're you know probably on the brink of hypo too too often and um but she's she's done well with it and um you know we're we're see where it goes but um and that that's where i I don't always try to impress a hundred percent of what i would do because everyone's body works different and, yeah. and, you know, it's worked well for her. She's got great control. Um, but at the same time, probably because of, um, and, and she's been a nurse and been in the diabetes education side of things too. Um, she's scared crazy of carbohydrates. Like they just that's, terrified. that's crazy. Yeah. I, I, I eat a good like, one. What do you mean I need to add 30 carbs? Like my blood sugar is going to go through the roof. And I was like, it shouldn't. And you have, she's got, you know, multiple, um, she got a Frieza. She's got Nova Log, and you know she, she doesn't really use short acting. She just kind of does her basal um, and just up with food. So, um, so it'd be neat. It'd be, be cool to see where we go. Yeah, I mean, I I would kill for an A one C at foot four, four, like or for leaving somewhere close to that. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, she had she had an interesting. You know, you know, I said, well, you know, I, I questioned her. I said, well, you know, what's normal blood sugar? And she's like. 80 to 110. I was like, well, they say 80 to 120, right? So, you know, if you're a little bit over that, or maybe you're high normal. And she's like, she's like, yeah, but I don't know if I believe that. And I was like, I was like, okay, I mean, I could, I could also see where you're coming from. Like, these are studies and these are normal ranges that are formulated by what population? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Normal, healthy functioning individuals, but these are normal, healthy functioning individuals that um, are on Americanized diets, right? <laughs> yep. Like, yeah, there's maybe they're 30 something year olds, but you know, they eat McDonald's and processed foods and all this crap. So, you know, I think her philosophy is, is like, I feel like a tighter range 
of 70 to 100 in her mind is, is ideal. And, you know, um, it's hard to say this is what the research shows. As long as you're not risking, you know, losing your, your sense of hypoglycemia and she's under good control, then, you know, I'd rather see that than someone that's like, okay, being in the low twos, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. ultimately that's that, that's the slow, slow one that gets you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Very cool. So um, we're getting close to the end. So, um, well, one other question about uh, your, you being a coach before we do that. So like, what is your, because obviously like every coach has different styles of training. So what, what's your style of coaching? Uh, when it comes to like training, I'm, I'm a big um, variety guy. So, you know, with most of my clients, I'm going to be changing their plans every three weeks. And in, within that, we may see, you know, progressions of super or of certain exercises, but oftentimes like the split's going to change. Um, you know, the body parts that we train together may vary. You know, they're often in bodybuilding, they're going to be more body part specific, but mm -hmm. like there might be, you know, it might be a chest day, you know, one time and then arms are done a separate day. And then a different progression might be, you know, chest and triceps, or it might be opposing groups. It might be, you know, antagonist muscle group paired with it. Um, and, you know, I believe in you know, mix it up. Your rep range is a lot, um, circuits and stuff closer to shows to help improve conditioning, things like that. Okay. All right, cool. All right. So, um, here are the final questions. So, um, do you have any goals for the rest of the year? It could be like personal or business wise. Um, yeah, you know, I think I'm going to build the coaching a little bit more this year. Um, it's been it's been fun just kind of see it um, evolve in a more systematic in, in way in which I'm doing it. Um, just with technology out there, I can get people plugged into the computer, um, you know, with a Fitbit to where I can see how many steps they're doing. And, mm -hmm. you know, I can see all their food intake. And it's just, it, it's cool. It's like, I'm, you know, you know, the mastermind up here, and I can see all the variables. Um, so I definitely want to grow that some more. Um, and maybe do some more stuff like this, because I, I always do enjoy it. Um, but sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm running around so much. I don't have, you know, enough time to, to, to do similar. Yeah, no, I hear you. I, I, it's the same way too. I'm always having like, try, try to find like sent days to interview people. And especially like, I have two young kids. So like literally when you text me saying, Hey, we're still on for the podcast. I was like running around, getting them a shower, like throwing them in bed and getting this ready. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's hard, but I mean, it, it's, I, I love, I love doing this just in meeting people, like, especially like you and like other people that you know, I would have no chance if, you know, I didn't have this to meet you guys. Sure. No, no, man. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm honored to, to be on the podcast. I'm definitely going to uh, go back through and listen to, to some of your, your other shows and stuff too. Yeah. Very cool. So um, do you have a favorite book? Do you like to read? You know, I'm, I'm always into like more like motivational type books and stuff. Um, you know, the four agreements I think is probably my favorite book. Um, I can't remember who writes it, who wrote it, now, but, um, I was going to drop the name, but, um, stuff like that, you know, I always find that it's, it's refreshing and stuff. I find myself just getting into audiobooks, and I try to, you know, put them on with like a sleep timer, like 30, 40 minutes. And I feel like, you know, my OCD brain will, will pick up little pieces here and there. Hopefully I pick up an, enough little good things that, you know, I could piece them together. Mm hmm very cool. Um, and then what is in your gym bag? Oh, my gym bag. Um, you know, usually some, some wrist straps for, if I'm going heavy with certain things to save the hands, um, I'll have a pre-workout in there, some BCAAs, um, and then just gym clothes. And usually okay. layers, I'll usually kind of dress in layers so that I'm, you know, if it's, if it's cooler out, I can warm up and then kind of strip down okay so do, do bcaa's well i'm actually i think there is i think i have a video uh, on youtube somewhere that i did with all max that's like what's in your gym bag and it's okay. actually how to, it's a, how to build like an ideal gym bag which is something i preach to people too that are like oh i don't have time if, and i always tell people if you put everything that you need you know from a clothing standpoint and from like like a supplement standpoint in there and it's with you all the time then you have no excuse not to go yeah, I'll definitely, I'll definitely try to find that and link it to the show too. So, um, with BCAAs, my problem, if I ever take BCAAs, my blood sugar, like goes 
like high 300s like taking that stuff does that ever happen to you at all or no and that's a unique thing about um because i've heard that with, with other um type ones too um now i'm not speaking like I, I sip on them all day you know not not necessarily for the nutritional effect but the fact that i just like a little bit of flavor in my water and i drink more water with it if yeah. anything mm-hmm. um i'm lucky enough to get them free so you know it, it'd probably add up otherwise um yeah you don't have any sugar or anything in them yeah no, it just just You're, just anything. It's crazy. So yeah, like, I know some things. Well, like when you mentioned like Advil, you know, I was thinking like anytime I take Advil, my blood sugar is just yeah. I that, that that's why I don't like taking anything. So like 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 you I, like when you're bodybuilding, I, I'm a regimen guy. I kind of eat the same thing over and over and over again. And yeah, yeah. the thing is, I don't get bored with it. So it's just like because I know I'm using it to fuel my body. So it's like most impossible. people do anyways. They're just doing a bologna sandwich and like you know, some crap food. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> true. True. Um, I'm going to go a little deep on this question. So sure. let's just say this is your last day on earth and yeah. you know, how do you want people to know you as? Yeah. Ooh. Um, I don't know. I would, I would, I would say, you know, friends, family, or, or people that I have coached that I'm kind of like a champion for them. You know, like I've always felt like I've, you know, rooted for people to do well. And I like to see people succeed. And um, I may not always be like running up to someone trying to give them my advice, but whenever, um, you know, someone asks for it or if I can help them, you know, I always enjoy that and try to pass it, pass it on, pass it forward because um, people have done that for me, you know, mentors, coaches, um, you know, people I've picked their brains and, um, I think if more people were willing to ask the questions, they would um, get, you know, get more answers. Sometimes people are, you know, nervous to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, I, I, I have a motto called screw it, just do it. Yeah. And so yeah. I read a book by Richard Branson. That was, that was the book called screw it, just do it. And that that's yeah. how like, you know, that's how we started this podcast. That was how I started like asking people questions about like certain things and stuff like that. Cause it's just like, that people want to help out like well some people so yeah. and they, they want to help out and so you know obviously kind of especially the older generation they want to show like you know sh- show what they've learned through the years to bring it on to somebody else so that's i'm a big proponent of that too yeah absolutely 100 percent. yeah so um where can people reach out to you if they have any questions about like bodybuilding getting on your program or anything like that yeah um really the the only social media that I'm active on is my um, Instagram, which I'm not overly active on there. Most of it you'll see is just some of the stuff that I do with my supplement sponsor stuff, but it's just at Brett Khan. So B R E T T K A H N. All right. Very cool. Well, thank you very much for doing this. You know, it's always awesome to talk to another diabetic. I always call people that I've talked to that are diabetic diabetes. So, um, you know, I do appreciate it and thank you for taking the time because I know you're, a busy guy. And I, I do appreciate everything, you know, the, our, from our conversation. Of course, man. I appreciate you having me. All right. Thanks. Cool. Thank you.